an all-new Dr. Phil. Human remains found in a recycling bin. The man accused of killing a Seattle mom. I remember saying to myself, I'm not surprised. His ex-girlfriend speaks out. You say he choked you. He put his hands around my throat and squeezed. The shocking photo. Do you know if that's the only time he ever put on your undergarments? The exclusive interview. He left behind a blanket. My daughter sleeps with that blanket. A blanket from a man accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children. Plus. I encountered one of the most serious serial killers and I lived to tell about it. She stared serial killer Ted Bundy in the eye. Nobody has ever heard your story before. Until now. We're back at the spot where this horrible thing happened. He leaned in really close. I thought that he was going to kiss me. Her terrifying ordeal. He probably strangled me to unconsciousness five or six different times. He said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. I thought I was going to die right there in the car. But he had other, other plans. He said, don't die on me yet because you would miss the best part. Today with two television exclusives. Here's Dr. Phil. It's a shocking, gruesome murder that left many on edge. Ingrid Lyne, a beautiful mother of three, leaves for a date to a baseball game and is never seen again until her head and body parts begin appearing scattered across Seattle. Bombshell tonight. A mom of three dips her toe back into the dating scene. It all ends in tragedy. A disturbing discovery in Seattle Central District. Suspected human remains found inside a recycling bin. That missing mom found dead. Her remains wrapped in plastic bags and, quote, still fresh. Police are working with just a few disturbing clues. Pieces of Ingrid, carefully wrapped and stashed in recycling bins. A 15-inch pruning saw in the bathroom of her house. Blood and flesh inside the pipes underneath her bathtub. In my experience, we're looking at one of two things. A serial killer who gets real joy about doing this. Or perhaps she was murdered during a very vicious argument. Now he's got a dead body. What does he do with it? He cuts it up and he distributes all over Seattle, thinking that she won't be identified. Ingrid's mother looked up a recurring phone number on her daughter's phone and found it belonged to John Robert Charlton. She sent a text to the number saying that she had called 911. He wrote back, 911? What's going on? We went to the Mariners game last night, but we didn't stay the night together because she has her kids today. Ingrid's mother replied, she's missing. What time did you see her last? A police officer needs to speak to you as you may be the last person who saw her. The minute that she mentioned, you need to speak to the police, the conversation went cold. Big red flag. We used some forensic evidence dealing with uh, telephone calls and cell towers. By utilizing those, we were led to a suspect. The man she'd been on a date with Friday night is in jail, suspected of murdering her. Seattle police says it's digging into Charlton's background, which it suggests includes a history of violent crime. This heinous crime has everyone wondering how and why. Today, speaking for the first time in an exclusive interview, we are talking to a woman who believes she knew John Charlton intimately. When she read the headlines, she almost threw up and thought Ingrid Lyne could have been me. Here's my exclusive interview with Heather Danishevsky. This is a tale of this innocent woman being murdered and then dismembered. How did you find out about this this gruesome murder? I just happened across a news article and it, the name John Robert Charlton popped up and I was like, oh my goodness, so I started reading it and I immediately went into shock. I got sick to my stomach. Uh, I couldn't even speak. When you read that, did it strike a chord within you that said, I can believe this? Oh, yeah, definitely. I actually remember saying to myself, I'm not surprised. Because you understand, we're talking about somebody that murdered the mother of three, allegedly, dismembered her body, and scattered it around. Now, he's not admitted that. Right. And so we have to say that. But what in your experience made you say, I, I believe it? Well, he's very charming, witty, very smart. But I could tell 
that there was something about him that just was off, maybe a little mental instability. Um, there, there was just a, there was a dark side to him. I tell him there, there is something scary about your eyes, something mysterious and just off about your your eyes. And he's like, don't say that. Now, how long were you in a relationship with him? Roughly six months. We started seeing each other December of 2012, and I ended it August 2013. When you first met him, was he clearly trying to get in a relationship with you? Well, how it happened was we were working together, and we started hanging out and got into a relationship, and uh, we were kind of together off and on during those six months. Was he attentive? Was he loving? Was he... Very much so. I remember when we had first gotten together, my daughter was really sick, so he actually um, came and visited us at the hospital, brought me food. I was starving. Brought her a teddy bear. So he moved in with you and your daughter? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And when he moved in, was he comfortable to be around living together 24-7? Yes and no. After, after he did move in, I kind of noticed I felt like I was walking on eggshells. He kind of gave me the sense sometimes that everything I did wasn't good enough. I didn't want to do anything that would be wrong in his eyes. And when you did something that was wrong in his eyes, how would he express that? It was almost like he gave me a lecture, you know, because he was a very black and white thinker. It's either this way or this way with him. And it was hard convincing him otherwise. So he did was, like, he was a difficult per We We did argue. We fought a lot, actually. And how did that go? A lot of the times we did argue was alcohol involved. When he drank, he became a completely different person. He was mean, stubborn, bullheaded. He was never violent, like he never hit me or anything like that. It was mostly just emotionally, just really, he'd really get inside your head. So alcohol changed him? Oh, definitely. And how often would he drink? Um, more than he probably should have. I mean, he was on probation at the time. And he was on probation for what? I believe it was for a theft that occurred in Montana. Okay, and, and he told you about that, yes. right? And he told you it was about stealing a purse? From a breastfeeding woman. She was breastfeeding her baby and he stole her purse. What did you say about that? Because it seems to me like that's kind of really a pretty low life thing to do. That is very much, yeah, very much so, but... How did you make that okay with yourself? I like to see the best in people. I like to see potential in people, and it did seem like he was trying to make things better. You said he wasn't violent, but you did say he choked you. He did one night. I know it was a night we had gone out, and we were drinking, and then it turned into us being sexually active. And during it, he put his hands around my throat and squeezed and it scared me because he, he kept getting a little harder and harder and harder to the point where it got harder to swallow it was getting harder to breathe and then if I remember right even after we were done we were dressed he then again put his hands around my throat and did the same thing and he said you're going to fix this you are going to fix this as he has his hands around my throat I actually got really scared I was like is he going to stop is this going to escalate further there's a million things going through my mind did this scare you the same as when he did it during the sex? Hey, during the sex, I thought it was just maybe, you know, like, you know, some people are kind of weird like that. Then when he did it, when we weren't being sexually active is when it really started to scare me. And that's when, you know, the thoughts are racing, like, is he going to stop? Am I going to have to defend myself? You had said that he seemed to enjoy hurting you. As, as almost like it gave him a sense of authority, like a sense of power to constantly be lecturing me or telling me things should go this way or things should go that way. It seemed like he thrived on making people feel bad, like pointing out their flaws. So this incident that you're talking about was before he moved in with you? If I remember right, yeah. How did you categorize this in your mind that you made it okay for him to move in with you and your daughter? This is a guy that's demeaning you. Then he's choking you to the point that it's scaring you. Is this going to stop? And then you say, yeah, get your stuff and move in. How did you make that make sense? Okay, I was young at the time. I was 24. I was smitten with this guy. I mean, he was very good looking, very smart. And then, of course, I told myself, maybe if he just stops drinking, you know, it won't happen anymore. Did his probation officer find out he was drinking? Yeah, he did, actually. I remember... How did he find out? Uh, we went out for Valentine's Day, 
we were drinking, and I think it was my landlord. He swears up and down it was me, but I never did that. He thinks you called his probation officer and said he's drinking in violation of probation and he needs to go yep, to jail. Yeah, he did, he did. He spent like four or five days in jail. You're talking about Valentine's Day. There's an interesting picture that you gave us today. Yes. Was he drunk in this picture? No, no. This is when we were getting ready to go to the restaurant. So this is before you went out? Yes. So he's not drunk here? No, just goofing off. That's one of our very few fun moments we had together. Now, how did that come about? I honestly don't know. I just remember walking out of the bathroom and he just started posing. I was like, okay, I got to get a picture of this because this is hilarious. Do you know if that's the only time he ever put on your clothes, your undergarments? That's the only time I'm aware of, yes. This is the day that wound up getting him arrested for violation of probation and put in jail. Uh-huh. Okay. It comes where you do break up. How did that come about? It just, it got too much for me. It's not healthy for me. It's not healthy for my daughter. So a couple weeks go by and um, I get a text. He's like, so uh, how are things going? What's going on? I'm like, you know, if I'm spending more time with my daughter. And I don't think I need you in my life anymore. And that was that. And I had not heard from him since. When you think back now that a man that is allegedly capable of doing what you now have read about, was sleeping in the same bed with you, was sleeping just feet away from your daughter. How do you react to that now? Coming up. My daughter was very, very attached to John. He left behind a blanket. Even to this day, she sleeps with that blanket. How do you feel about your daughter having a physical attachment to a blanket from a man who's accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children? And later, she survived an attack from serial killer Ted Bundy. So at this point, you think, I'm going to have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. He leaned in really close. I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. Tomorrow. My daughter pretends to be a cheerleader, the Catfish Boys. You posted, are you ready for a hot bod? Here we come, cheer camp. Well, I don't remember doing that. Is this the face of a pretty little liar? I found Ryan soliciting sex for money on Craigslist. I was never going to sell myself for money. I'm at my house and no one's home. Then you include a picture that we can't show here. Then on Thursday... The daughter of Whitney Houston has died. The autopsy results are in, and Nick Gordon sits down to look Dr. Phil in the eye. Did you murder Bobby Christina Graham? All new Dr. Phil. That's Thursday. We now return to a beautiful mother, dead and dismembered. The ex-girlfriend of the man accused speaks out. Charlton has a criminal past stretching across six states. But our protection order petition from 2006 stands out. His father reported Charlton took the movie Hannibal from his shelf and showed it to his mother, telling her she should watch it and, quote, beware. Ingrid Lyon was reportedly dating John Charlton for just over a month. They were still relative strangers. How much did she really know about him? Did Ingrid know he had a lengthy criminal history? He has convictions for misdemeanor assault, misdemeanor battery, felony theft, and second degree felony and aggravated robbery. When you think back now that a man that is allegedly capable of doing what you now have read about was sleeping in the same bed with you, how do you react to that now? Makes my skin crawl makes me sick. I regret not saying anything to anybody. I didn't even tell my own mom. I mean, the least I could have done was tell somebody, his probation officer, anybody. Just, I mean, I know that it might not have made a, a difference or an impact in what happened with this woman, but at least it would have been on record. And how old was your daughter in 2013? Four or five. Does she know what has happened with him now? Yeah, she was very, very attached to John. I mean, even after we had split up, he left behind a blanket. 
Even to this day, she sleeps with that blanket. It is her favorite blanket. I know when I'm scrolling through Facebook, she'll, you know, she'll be sitting by my side and we'll look at pictures and she goes, Mom, is that, was that John? I'm like, yes. Well, what's going on? You know, I explained he had badly hurt a woman. She's not here anymore. And I remember her asking me, she goes, Mommy, are you sad? I'm like, yeah, I'm very sad. Because she had three little girls of her own. How do you feel about your daughter having a physical attachment to a blanket from a man who's accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children? Her attachment isn't as strong as it was, say, a few years ago. I mean, now she just acknowledges that, oh, yeah, that's the blanket John gave me, and that's that. I mean, she acknowledges, she goes, John did a very bad thing, and he's kind of a bad guy now, huh, Mom? I'm like, yeah, he, he's a very bad man. Well, I'll give you a piece of advice you didn't ask for. You might want to get her a new blanket. I think I might. It can be very confusing to her because the older she gets, the more aware she's going to become right. of what he's accused of doing, what he may be convicted of doing. And if she finds out that she's drawn comfort from something that is attached to someone that allegedly has been involved in that kind of horrific conduct and behavior, it's very easy for her to say, what's wrong with me that I have felt this emotional comfort or attachment. So you might take her out of that position just when she's gone to school. Most definitely. That just might not be there when she got and that's, back. That's fine with me. That is absolutely fine I, with I'd, me. I'd you really are very protect right. her from herself on that because she, she doesn't know. I'm so glad to be talking to you right now. We always say hindsight is 2020. You would do things very differently today oh, than most definitely. you would then. And I'll leave you with this thought. The statistics are that the frequency of abuse of a child when a non-biological male is in the home is 33 times normal. Mm. What it is if you don't move that person in. And I tell you that to think about going forward. Most definitely. We need to be really careful and thoughtful about who we expose our children to. Certainly who we let into our home. Most definitely. To become part of the fabric of their lives. I know a few of my family members are really upset with me learning about this man, John, because I would invite him to family functions. My family would invite him. He never wanted to go. He never wanted to be around them. I think it's really important to decide before the charm kicks in. Most definitely what discontinuation criteria are because you saw something wrong about this guy then you knew this guy stole a breastfeeding mother's purse and you saw that he changed when he was under the influence but the charm had set in because love is blind and it can Very really much. cause you to overlook some things. I think you've helped some people to think twice about what they do. Thank you so Very much for so talking to us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate me. it. We reached out to Gordon Hill, John Charlton's public defender. He did not return our request for comment before our broadcast deadline. In published news reports, he has said that there is absolutely no forensic evidence linking Charlton to Ingrid's murder, and he has denied his client's involvement in this heinous crime. And let me be very clear, while John Charlton has been charged in connection with her death, it is still early in this case. He hasn't even entered a plea yet to the crimes he is charged with. He is scheduled to be in court tomorrow. Coming up. A woman who fell prey to a handsome, charming, and murderous man. For decades, Rhonda Stapley didn't tell a soul that she was kidnapped and almost killed by America's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. Today, she's finally breaking her silence and telling her story. He put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. I thought I was going to die right there in the car. That's next. My mom says I have a mental disorder. <laughs> You guys said she ripped the wings off of a pet bird. I did not kill my bird. You little witch. Your children have been removed from the home. I'm in Hollywood right now, so how can I worry about my children? I've been worried about your children. Why don't you take them then, you little witch? Oh, Off before I hit you on stage. 
They believe a stranger is obsessed with their twin daughters. She took my photos offline and made up a complete lie of her as their mom. My girls are in picture frames all over her house. How did hundreds of pictures of their twins get on your Facebook page? I honestly don't know. You're a damn liar. You've claimed my girls as your own girls and it's not a freaking stop. He was a major league pitcher. Now his family says he's a drunk. You've been self-medicating with alcohol because your dream got ripped from you. I'm not a drunkard. This is that bottom of the ninth, man. You got to do this. The Dr. Phil Show now continues with another exclusive interview. Ted Bundy is one of America's most infamous serial killers. Dubbed the Lady Killer. One of the most famous psychopaths in Utah's history is Ted Bundy. The serial rapist and murderer was captured and caught here. The good-looking, charismatic Bundy admitted to killing at least 30 women. But some say he could have committed a hundred or more during his reign of terror. A judge in Miami today followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Theodore Bundy to die in the electric chair for the murder of two co-eds. He hereby imposed the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. But there was one secret victim, one who got away, one who has never told her story until now. Rhonda Stapley was a young, innocent college student when she accepted a ride from a handsome stranger. When she got into his old Volkswagen, she had no idea she was sitting next to America's most notorious serial killer and was about to look death right in the face. Nobody in the world has ever heard your story before. Tell me how you encountered Ted Bundy. It was October of 1974. And I was a, a pharmacy student at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I was at a city park waiting for a bus to take me back up to campus. The bus was late. I was getting frustrated. And then this tan Volkswagen drove by very slowly cute driver kind of looked at me as he went past and then he stopped and backed up and leaned over and rolled down the passenger window and asked me where I was going. I told him I was going up to the U and he said me too hop in. So I opened the door and got in. The first thing that I noticed was the inside passenger door handle was missing and he leaned over and pulled the door shut but I wasn't alarmed. I figured college kid college car things fall off. How does he look to you at the time? He looked like a college student. He was dressed nice, had a green pullover, sweater on, nice slacks. And you say, okay, because he looks like the fabric of the university community. He didn't look like an outsider. He didn't look like we would think about a predator. Right. So you drive off, and what was his demeanor? Lighthearted. We just had the normal conversation that strangers would have. I told him, my name's Rhonda and I'm a pharmacy student. What are you studying? He told me his name was Ted and he was a law student. In a, just a couple of blocks, he turned a way that wasn't the normal route to the university. And I asked him about that and he was very polite and asked my permission if it would be all right if he took a little detour. He told me he had to run an errand up by the zoo and I told him that would be fine. I didn't care, I thought I would still be home faster than if I had waited for the bus. And then we went right on past the zoo. And I said, hey, I thought we were taking me to the zoo. And he said, no, I said, near the zoo. That road goes over the hill and drops down into Parley's Canyon, which is the main highway back into the city. Nothing's gone off in your head yet? Nothing's gone off, we're just having fun. We get to the bottom of that canyon, we should have turned right to go towards campus. And instead he turned left and started driving up another canyon. And as he's driving, he's kind of looking at parking places and side roads. The conversation started to go weird then because he stopped talking to me and I'm still trying to make idle conversation and and I'm thinking that he's probably looking for a place to pull off in the park and wants to make out and I don't know him and I'm not really a make out person but he's still a cute law student and I don't want to offend him and I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'm thinking of how do I get out of this situation. And then he pulled into a parking place and, and parked the car and turned it off. So at this point, you think, I'm going to have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. And then he turned in the car seat, so he's kind of facing me, and he leaned in really close. 
I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. And he put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. My first thought was, it has to be some kind of a joke. This guy's got a weirdest sense of humor. But that was just maybe a fraction of a second because I realized he was squeezing too tightly. He was serious and I was in trouble. And there's no door handle. What did you do? We had a little small battle in the car, but I went unconscious. So he choked you to the point of unconsciousness? Yes. Did you put up a fight? I did as much of a fight as you can put up when you're running out of air. Did you think at that point... I'm going to die. You think I'm dying in this Volkswagen bug right here? I thought I was going to die right there in the car. But he had other, other plans. Coming up... He said, good girl, good girl. Don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. Thursday, Nick Gordon returns. Well, you left money in the will by Whitney. Photos surfaced of Chrissy smoking out of a bong and snorting cocaine. Did she have a drug problem? Yeah, it got really bad. Were you a bad influence on her? They say you punched her in the face and kicked her to the point she was on the floor screaming and you dragged her up the stairs by her head. And the question everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? That's Thursday. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly. I escaped serial killer Ted Bundy. In the tapes made available this weekend, Bundy tells of a murder and describes himself in the third person. He placed his hands around her throat, just a throb of her unconsciousness so that she wouldn't scream anymore. We're back at this spot where this horrible thing happened 40 years ago. Coming back feels kind of creepy. I didn't really remember the sound of the water until we came back here. I remember it clearly now. There was a picnic table in this area. The Volkswagen was parked in that area over there. Then he turned off the lights. We were sitting in the car at the time. He strangled me unconscious. I thought I'm gonna die. I am really gonna die. So I just came to on the picnic table. So you go unconscious. You wake up on a picnic table. Are you near the car? Probably about 30 feet away from the car. Okay. Do you know how much time has transpired? I don't. I woke up, he was slapping my face like they do on the movies when they're wanting to wake somebody up from being drunk or something. Mm -hmm. And then he pulled me off the picnic table and was slugging me in the stomach. I was doubled over on the ground, begging him to stop. Were you screaming and crying? Yes, and, and begging for my life. I was um, telling him, don't, don't hit me anymore. You know. And he's hitting you in the stomach? I'm losing my breath. I'm almost throwing up. I'm worrying that ribs are breaking and stuff, possibly. Okay, and so now you're on the ground. Now I'm on the ground. And he sat on me, on my stomach and chest, mashing me so that there's no air. And I said, get off. I can't, can't breathe. And he said, you have to relax. And if you stop struggling, I'll let you breathe. And so I held still for a minute, and he did let me breathe a little bit, kind of scooted back on me so he wasn't smashing me so much. And then he um, put his hand over my nose and mouth and cut off my air. And I passed out again, and he sort of enjoyed just watching me die. He would do that over and over. At one point, he asked me, how would I prefer to be strangled? How would I prefer to suffocate? Would you prefer it like this? And he put his hand over my nose and mouth again. Or is it better for you like this? And he put his hands on my throat again. I just thought I was gonna die. And how many times do you think he took you to unconsciousness and, and then brought you back? Probably at least five, maybe six. Really? And did you get the sense that he knew how far to go without killing you? Yeah, I think it was a game. And then what happened? The last time as I was coming from unconsciousness to consciousness lying on the picnic table, he was slapping my face again, trying to wake me up again. And he said, good girl, good girl, you don't want to die yet. Don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. 
and he grabbed me by my boots at the end of the picnic table, pulled my pants down and raped me. And just as that was finishing, he leaned forward again and put his hands around my throat and was choking me again. And at that point, I, I, I didn't struggle. I decided I was dead. I was just going to wait until it was over. When he raped you, was he quiet? Was he talking? He was, he was silent. All I remember is his eyes were just black and evil. The next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground. And I was sort of surprised when I came to again. And it's pitch dark, and he was standing by the open door, fiddling with something in the back seat, like 30 feet away from me. And I didn't really plan anything like a great escape, but adrenaline was running, and I just jumped and ran. I didn't run very far because my pants were in a wad around my ankles. I tripped after just one or two steps, but fortunately or luckily or intervention from above or something, I fell into a fast-moving mountain river. That swept me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. Coming up. How far did you fall before you hit the water? Six feet. Face first? Yeah. I'm feeling like I'm drowning. I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and I thought that I was still going to die. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. My daughter pretends to be a cheerleader to catfish boys. You posted, are you ready for a hot bod? Here we come, cheer king. Well, I don't remember doing that. All-new Dr. Phil. That's tomorrow. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly, a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ted Bundy is one of the world's most famous and studied serial killers. He was a kidnapper, a sadistic serial rapist, a torturer, a murderer, and it's the way he went about those murders that is so disturbing. He probably strangled me to unconsciousness five or six different times. The last time I woke up, I was on the picnic table. I came to, and you can see a little light coming from the dome light of the car. He was probably looking for the crowbar to make sure I was dead. I just thought, run. I was still lightheaded from being unconscious. I didn't notice that I was running towards a river and a cliff instead of towards a forest. And the next thing I knew, I was landing in ice cold, stop your heart cold water, which was sweeping me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. At the same time, I thought, I'm still going to die. I encountered one of the most serious serial killers, and I live to tell about it. How far did you fall before you hit the water? I think it's probably about six feet. I kind of scooted, slid down the embankment and landed. Face first? Yeah. This is October, right? It's got to be cold. It, it was like stop your heart coldness water. Just all of a sudden, I'm in the water. And I'm, I'm not feeling safe yet. I'm feeling like I'm drowning. I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and forced under bushes and stuff by the force of the water. I thought that I was still going to die. You are ultimately stopped against a grate, right? Some yeah, type of some kind of a metal grate to catch tree limbs and debris going down the river. How did you get out of the river? I climbed out with the use of the debris as kind of a little stepping stone. Your pants are still around your feet. Still around my feet. And yeah. so you get your clothes back on as best you can. Do you have any shoes on? Yes, I was wearing brand new hiking boots that day and wrapped the laces around my ankle about three times and double knotted them. And that's probably why that he couldn't get them off and neither did the river. Now you've climbed out of the river. Do you have any idea where you are? I know that I'm about four miles up the canyon. So I followed the river and just walked out of the canyon. I was terrified. I thought he would find me and if he did, he would stab me or choke me or run over me or... You thought if you got on the road, he would come driving by? He would, yeah, that's and what I find thought. And find you. So you stayed... So I stayed right along the riverbank. God, I'm proud of you. God bless you. Okay, so you get back to civilization. Where did you get to ultimately? Walked all night to my apartment on the university campus. You walked a hell of a long way. Yes. After being horrifically brutalized... Were you still worried he would find you? Yeah, I was ducking behind trees, and whenever any kind of car would turn toward me, my heart rate would go up, and I would just know I was going to die. Is it still dark when you get home? It's starting to get light. When I got to the bottom of campus, kind of on my turf, and I'm feeling more empowered and more anger than fear. 
at that point. So you go to your apartment. Where are your things? I had a backpack uh, with my driver's license and student ID, stuff like that. And the backpack I had left probably still in the Volkswagen. He had your name? Had my name. He could have found me if he had wanted to. So you make it back to your apartment. What did you do? Showered, got out of those clothes and bathed, drained the water and bathed again. And then I slept. I was exhausted. You wake up later that day. Thinking I've got to, I've got to do damage control. I've got to get my river ruined clothes off the bathroom floor. And I've got to put on long sleeve shirts and I've got to cover my bruises because I don't want anybody to know that this has happened. Tell me, what's your 21-year-old mind telling you that you have to hide this? I'm feeling shamed. I'm embarrassed. I feel stupid for having even gotten myself into such a dangerous situation. I should have known better. I thought that if my mother found out, she'd make me drop out of school and go home. I imagine people pointing at me and saying, that's that girl that was raped. How did this sit with you across time, living with us alone? I, I hadn't dealt with my own, my own emotional pain. And then the news was reporting that other people were missing it. They were finding bodies up the canyon. And every time that happened, I was feeling guilt about all those other women. That if I had come forward, maybe he would have been captured. I had all this nervous energy right after that. I was total insomniac, so I would put on my clothes and go running in the middle of the night. Do you know why you did that? I think I was trying to run away from myself and try to run away from remembering. It's just a, a way of coping. As people value their lives less, we tend to see them engage in high-risk behaviors more. Yes. It's like... Yeah, I guess I could get killed, but... What could they do to me that hasn't already been done? How did you feel when he was arrested? Coming up. When I saw him on TV, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy. And I knew their monster was my monster. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview. I escaped serial killer Ted Bundy. Pensacola, Florida police are questioning a man they say may be one of the worst sex murderers of all time. He has been positively identified as prison escapee Theodore Bundy, a suspect in the rape murder cases of at least 36 young women in California, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and Michigan. How did you feel when he was arrested? When I saw him on TV, and then I knew his real name was Ted, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy, and, and I knew... Their monster was my monster. You know why he didn't lie about his name. Because you weren't intended to leave that... Parking lot. Didn't matter that you knew his name. Mm -hmm. What do you see when you look at that face now? What a waste. His whole life was about hurting people and causing pain and suffering. And he looked so normal. When you got married, and started a family. I mean, what did you say to yourself? Well, I thought that it wouldn't really be possible. But then I met my husband. I told him that I had been raped. He said it didn't matter, and he didn't ask for details, and I didn't offer any. He accepted me for who I was. You made a beautiful bride. Thank you. <laughs> we had two daughters together, lots and lots of pets. I had a career as a pharmacist. Um, life was good. Tell me about the process you went through in deciding to write this book. What happened is I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And I started having flashbacks and memories and panic attacks and nightmares. And being a victim is a very lonely feeling because you feel like you can't really tell people. And nobody would really understand because nobody has experienced what you have. How dark did this get for you in the aftermath? Very dark. The darkest was probably when I realized that all those other people may have lived if I had come forward, I realize now through therapy I don't need to feel guilty about that because he was Ted Bundy and he would have killed people whether they were the Utah people or, or not. How bad did the guilt get for you? I self-medicated. Uh, at one point you overdosed? Yes, right after his escape, his first escape. Was it intentional? Yes. I don't know if I really wanted to die or if I just wanted to stop the pain. If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, 
Knowing what you know now, what would you say to her then? Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, what would you say to her then? It's not your fault, Rhonda. And you are the same person that you were before. Um, you're not damaged and you didn't ask for it. Um, you're not stupid. She deserved better than she got in the parking lot and she deserved better than she got in the years that followed. True? True. And you're still here. I am. I know that if we suffer in silence, then it just becomes penalty. But if we create meaning to our suffering, then it becomes tuition. We get something out of it. And there are thousands upon thousands of 21-year-old Rondas, and they're hearing you now Maybe it gives them the strength to report something and keep someone else from falling victim. That's why I said I'm so glad that you're here and so glad that you've written this book, and I want everybody to read this book. Rhonda, thank you for telling your story. Thank you. I want to thank both Heather Danishevsky and Rhonda Stapley for sharing their stories today. It takes real bravery to come forward and talk about things that perhaps are easier to leave buried. All women should use these stories as teaching tools to keep themselves safe. It's about trusting your gut instinct and hopefully by hearing these stories, that gut instinct will be razor sharp. Rhonda's book is called, I Survived Ted Bundy, The Attack, Escape, and PTSD That Changed My Life. Her book comes out in May. I want to thank Heather for sharing her story. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of Ingrid Lyon, mother of three, tragically taken far too soon. 